Tribal Trails, Tribal Trails. Hi, welcome to Tribal Trails. Our first guest today is Mervyn Tichu. In the Sudbury First Nation Church, he shares his insight on a very famous Bible story in Luke chapter 10, where a certain lawyer tested Jesus, asking him, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus told him a parable which we call the Good Samaritan. In the story, Mervyn has found three types of people representing three types of attitudes. The first uh, type of people uh, represented by the, the thieves, the bandits, who robbed this uh, gentleman. And there, there are people who, uh, I have it written down this way, who live their life thinking that what's yours is mine. What you have, I want it, it's mine. And that's really the attitude of the thieves. They wanted what this uh, man had. The second type of people that we uh, mentioned here is, uh, the pre uh, is exemplified by the priest and the Levite who when they saw this guy hurting, it says they just passed by on the other side. They didn't take time for him. Those are people who say, what's mine is mine. Uh, selfishness or no compassion. There are many people like that today that don't show mercy. But instead, they just keep to themselves and as long as they're okay, they don't care about anybody else. Then the third person that is uh, shown here is the Good Samaritan. I like this one because it kind of tells us the, what's mine is yours, and that's really what the Good Samaritan showed in helping this man who fell to the thieves and to the robbers. You know, what I have, I'm going to give you to help you, to help you become better. This uh, scripture passage, the story that we read, is showing mercy and grace to a hurting and a wounded world. It's really what it is. And it really illustrates the ministry and the heart of Jesus Christ. What Jesus came to do for you and I here on this earth. You know, we live in a hurting world and I think we all know that. There are people everywhere who are wounded and hurting. In a lot of our First Nations communities. Some have been robbed and, or hurt and wounded by parental failure. Maybe mom and dad were, weren't what they really should have been. They weren't the mom and dads that they, they should have been to meet all the needs in our lives. Instead, they've hurt us and wounded us. The residential school experience, which we've heard much about, and all the atrocities that went on there, has caused a lot of pain in our lives. Sexual abuse. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse, spiritual abuse are things that people have experienced, many of us have experienced, that have caused hurt and has wounded us in our lives. Many of our children are in foster care today. They're not in our homes. They're not in our communities where they should be. We're hurting and they're hurting. There's poverty, abandonment, neglect, Adoption, fatherlessness, I'll just read a number of these things, family violence, divorce, racism, suicide. There's the issue of the missing and murdered indigenous woman also that's causing a lot of hurt and heartache and pain in our lives. So we live in a suffering world. We're, we're hurting. And that's why this story is so important. That's why it's in the Bible because it illustrates what Jesus Christ has came and done for you and I. I found six things here in my study 
the first thing that we find is that a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where this person who was robbed was. He came to where he was. And that's the first thing that Jesus can do for you and I. I don't know what situation you find yourself in today. I don't know what you're suffering with. I don't know what you're hurting with today. But I want to tell you that Jesus come to, can come to where you are. In your, into your situation. He can come into your pain and your hurt and woundedness. And make you whole. I remember a friend of mine telling me that he was hurt and wounded by some people in the church. And some of the members of that church often saw him during the week and would tell him, why don't you come to church? Why don't you come to church on Sunday? And he said he used to be just seething with anger inside and would say, why would I want to come to that church? And if Jesus really wants me, he said, then he'll come to where I was. There was a certain place in his community where he used to go as a hurting teenager. And you know what happened, folks? He said one day, Jesus came to where he was on those rocks as a hurting person. And he invited Jesus Christ into his life. But no matter how much you're hurting today, Jesus wants to come to where you are. And change your life. Yes, Jesus knows your hurts. Jesus feels your pain. That is why he is knocking at the door of your heart right now and asking you to let him come in to soothe the pain and bind the wounds in your life. Why not let Jesus come into your life today? If you want to talk to someone about your present life experience, call us. Our next guest is Anthony Wimagwans. He and his wife, Tina met with Rita in Sudbury, Ontario. First, Anthony describes what life was like growing up in an alcoholic home on Manitoulin Island. As a child, I remember, you know, going to get ready to go on a bus. People would be laying on the floor, passed out, and I'm walking over them. Yeah. And that's the almost everyday thing we'd see in our home. That's hard. Yes. I actually started drinking when I was five. Oh, my Lord. My dad uh, gave me some, some beer, and I drank maybe about three, three bottles of beer, and I was so drunk. And, oh, uh, at five years old. Yeah. And, uh, and ever since, I, I, well, I've been sneaking from their cases so I would run off. Yeah. That's the type of lifestyle that, that I, I lived in then. Uh, my dad was was very um, violent all the time, and um, she was always beating on my mother. My dad took out the gun as before, but this time he was really serious. He was gonna mm -hmm. kill every one of us. And I could hear my mom say, run, run. Oh. And um, everybody would just run off, and I was so small at the time. And um, I ended up getting stuck at the, at the house, and I couldn't cry because I, I knew if I cried, my dad would find me. You were hiding? Yes, I was hiding under the bed. Okay. And then uh, my older brother came to rescue me after. My dad eventually passed out sometime. Oh, so, okay. But I, I stayed And under, you stayed yeah, under? Yeah. yeah. And then I, I was, uh, they came and got me. Okay. So most of the time it would be running along the shoreline at the beach going to, to, to the neighbors barefoot. That continued until your teenage years? Yes, I started to notice the difference maybe around when I was maybe 10, 11, that uh, my, my mom and dad, uh, they stopped drinking and then and, and, uh, all the people that used to come to, my, to our house, no, were, they, they weren't coming no more. They, they were, but there were different people coming in and they had, uh, black books in their hands, Bibles. Yeah. And uh, that's when I began to notice the, the change in, in, in both my parents and they, they stopped drinking and they started talking about Jesus. They came to know the Lord? Yes, they came to know the Lord. Okay. Were you happy about the change? How did that affect your life? Well, for one thing, I've noticed there was food in the in the, oh. uh, in the, <laughs> in the, the house. refrigerator. Yeah. And, uh, oh. 
we were, you know, there was we were, we were being fed like yeah. like the way it's supposed to be, you know. Yeah. And um, that's the big change that I saw. Did the violence stop? Yes, the violence stopped. New people coming in, and the old people were gone. They were they didn't they didn't come around no more. So the change continued in your home into high school. Yeah, well, I, when I came to uh, attend high school, I, I left the home. Oh, okay. And that's when I started even drinking, drinking okay. more, because nobody was watching You came me. to Sudbury? Or yeah, where did you I came to school to Sudbury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After he got his grade 12, his dad drove him to Toronto and left him there to look for work. With $20 in his pocket, Anthony managed to survive. He lived in the subway for a while, then he found work in a factory where he made disc brakes. The Lord continued to look after him. He opened the door for him to take a course at the Union Hall to become an iron worker. In 1982, he was hired to build high-rises in Toronto. Anthony continued his drinking, but the Lord did something to slow him down. One day when he was intoxicated, he was hit twice by vehicles. He ended up with a broken leg in the hospital. And then uh, I moved, to, moved from, um, from, from uh, Toronto. I went to go live with my mom for, for a while when she was in Espoir. And then after I regained, um, regained my strength, I, I moved, moved on. I went out west. Oh. And that's when, that's when uh, really things began to change. I started going to church, but uh, when I was going there, and um, I wasn't fully prepared to, to commit my life. I used to smoke quite a bit, marijuana. Okay. And after, after a service, you know, I, I would go home and um, I would smoke, light up my joints and I would smoke and I'd say, that was a very good message. And, um, <laughs> I think I'm gonna go again. Okay. And uh, to find out more. <clears throat> so, anyways, this went on for maybe about the whole summer. And then and, um, the Lord showed me a vision. And in that vision, I was playing with this toy little snake. Like when you would grab it, that snake would move like this. I don't know if you remember those little toy pieces of snake. Oh, okay. Anyways, the Lord showed me that I was, I was playing with that snake. And then all of a sudden, there was a real snake wrapped around my arm. Uh -huh. And I couldn't shake it off. And it, was, it was the ugliest thing I ever saw. Oh, yeah. And uh, for the next five years, I was bound with, with my addiction, with uh, alcoholism and... Um, and marijuana. Marijuana and um, abusing uh, prescriptions. And where were you? In, in Sudbury. What when happened, that happened? In, in, in Calgary is my brother got stabbed to death. Oh, I guess that was supposed to be my wake-up call, but I yeah. failed to recognize it. And uh, I came back to Sudbury, and uh, and I found myself in that similar situation. Yeah. And um, but I didn't know what had happened, and uh, I, I I had a tube sticking out of my side, and uh, I was all bandaged up. And you got stabbed. Yes, uh, several times. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. When I left the hospital, uh, I, I thought nothing of it. You know, I went straight back to drinking. And uh, I was firefighting at the time. And um, I made my way to go home. And I stayed at my dad's place. This is where I, I've encountered God. Okay. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I remember we were partying at my dad's house. He was drinking again? Yeah. Oh, and, that's um, too bad. And everybody left. And uh, I was there uh, in my dad's house by myself. I began to hear voices. Yeah. And this particular voice that I heard, it was talking to me. I said, um, if it wasn't for me, for that young girl to make that phone call, you would have been dead. And that really caught my attention. And, uh, or when you were stabbed? 
-hmm. Yeah. I looked around the, my dad's house and to see where that voice is coming from, but I, I, there was, I couldn't see anybody. But the voice was so clear, and um, the voice spoke again. And she said, if it wasn't for me to bring the paramedics to pick you up in time, you would have been dead. And he spoke one more time. He said, if it wasn't for me to lead those doctors' hands to sew you up back together, you would have been dead. And it just hit me like a lightning. I literally f fell on my knees. I said, God, you love me that much. I said, I made a mess of my life. I live the way I want to live. I said, why don't you be the Lord of my life? And as soon as I said that, I felt this warm wave go through my body. And I must have fell asleep sometime after that. And when I woke up, my mind was racing. So you finally did it. You drank yourself and sick. Oh. And I remember talking to God. I said, God, whatever happened last night, if that was real or not, yeah. I've got to find out if that was real. I said, why don't you show me a sign? And as I was getting ready to go to work, I picked up my bag, put it on my shoulder, opened the door. As I opened the door, a hummingbird came and flew. <sighs> and he looked at me for 10 to 15 minutes. So it seemed until I remember, I said, God, show me a sign. Yeah. When I remembered that, then that bird flew away. So I knew what happened that night was real. So as I was going to work, and, and, and East Door was living in, in Kawani at the time, he was still alive then. Who was that, your brother? No, he was a pastor. He was a pastor. He, he, oh, okay. he used to pastor in, in a, a church in Mantuaning. Okay. And so I wanted, I wanted to go visit East Door, but uh, East Door wasn't there. And uh, I told Stella, I said, Stella, I said, I gave my life to the Lord. And she was so happy. She was jumping up and down. Who is Stella? <laughs> Stella, Stella Triddle. And so one of the con uh, East Door's um, that used to go to that congregation. Oh, okay. Yeah. I remember in my dad's house, there was a, a card like this. Oh, okay. And it had, it had uh, Psalms 23 on it. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't know how to pray at that time. Yeah. And uh, when I was at work, I was having a hard time breathing. And, um, and sometimes the pain would, uh, would literally make me paralyzed. I, would, I couldn't move. Mm. And I would pick up that, that, that bookmark that I had in my wallet and I would read that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He make me lay down in green pastures and leave me beside still waters of that. So and it, every time my pain would come, I would recite Psalms 23. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You took that with you to work? Yeah. All around me there was drinking and, and was taking place, and this was in the bush for firefighting. Yeah. And all that booze was there, all those drugs were there. And every time someone would offer me, I would say no. But because being so offered time and time again, like I, I couldn't resist anymore. Yeah. And, and I knew the, the next person that was gonna offer me, I was gonna take it. Yeah. And I remember praying to God. I said, God, I think it's time for you to bring me back home. I don't wanna go back. Yeah. Where you got me from. I don't want to go back. Yeah. 
That's all I said. That was about 10 o'clock in, in, in the morning when I, when, I, when I prayed that by 12 o'clock, the fire warden showed up at our campsite. He says, okay, you guys pack up your bags. We don't need you guys here. Go home. Mm -hmm. So the Lord answered my prayer. Yeah, he sure did. Amen. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. We see stories all through the Old Testament of how Jesus came to even our first ancestors, our first parents, Adam and Eve, after they disobeyed God. They didn't go looking for God. But God came and looked for them in the cool of the evening, it says, and said, Adam, where are you? God came looking for him. Moses, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were in bondage. God came looking for him to deliver his people out of bondage. We think of Samuel, we think of Isaiah, Daniel, and many others in the Bible. God came to where they were and called them to walk with him or to serve him or to do a work for them. And I want to tell you today that God can come to where you are. No matter what situation you find yourself, no matter how much you're hurting today, Jesus wants to come to where you are and change your life. This is good news. In John 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Some of you might ask, what's abundant life? The Greek word for abundance means something more or something better. So the abundant life that Jesus talked about is above any form of contented life in this world. Such contentment is based on the fact that God is above and over every situation and he is able to meet all our needs according to his will in Christ Jesus. So the abundant life isn't an easy, comfortable life. It is a life of satisfaction and contentment in Jesus, trusting that he has everything under his control and that he always has our best interest in mind. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul instructed us what to do in hard times. He said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you need prayer and encouragement for your walk with God, give us a call. We're glad to support you on your journey of faith.